It was midsummer when I got the message from my friend Sam. I was laying down in the sun in my back garden with my dog. His name was Brute and he was by my side. I opened my Instagram and saw I had a message. It read, Hey Casey, Kyle, Olive, Teresa and I are getting together to go camping in a week and I was really hoping you could join us. I wrote back, Of course, can I bring my dog? My phone then pinged with a response. Good idea. He'll scare away all the cryptids you're always talking about. They were right. I was obsessed with the paranormal, especially cryptids. So come Monday, when it was time to leave, I was sure to bring my notebook, my camera, and of course, my knife. Realistically, the last one was mostly for self-defense against any possible weirdos we might meet out there. My family always says I'm paranoid, but it's better safe than sorry, you know. We decided to take my vehicle so we could head deeper into the woods without having to carry our stuff. So after getting ready, I drove towards my closest friend Kyle's house. When I stopped outside his house, he was already waiting in the driveway. He jumped into the middle set of seats, wanting to sit next to my dog Brute. He was stretched out across the seat, sluggish from the heat, but he offered Kyle a tail wag recognition as my friend began to play with him. Hey, what's up, dude? I said, greeting my best friend. Hey, he responded. There was a pause before he leaned. So, Olive is coming on that trip, huh? Man, whatever, shut up, I said. He leaned back, smiling. Just be yourself. It'll be fine. You should really ask her, though. I hit the play button on my phone's Spotify playlist and turned it up way too loud to drown him out. We then went to go pick up Olive from her house, and then we picked up Sam and Teresa from their apartment in the city. By the time we reached the highway, it was nearly 5 p.m. I had turned on the music and we were sitting and talking to pass the time. After an hour or so, I turned off onto a smaller road and started heading for the bush. Hey Casey, how long until we get there? Kyle asked, who was still actually patting Brute. I shrugged, not taking my eyes off the road. Sounds like a question for the navigator, was my response. He turned to Olive, who was in the seat next to me with her phone linked up to the GPS. Should be about half an hour until we reach the bush, then another hour or so down the track to the campsite. He slumped back with a resigned sigh, his arms crossed over his stomach. Can we stop for a break soon? We stopped just before we got onto the highway. You'll live. He then returned patting Brute. After a moment, Sam spoke up. Casey, why don't you tell us what you think we'll see tonight? Everyone else perked up, watching me. Well, wekas are pretty common in the area. The normal deer, possibly. If we're lucky though, we'll hear the kiwi calling. This far out, we might even see one. If we're quiet. That would be excellent, but I more meant the creepy stuff, you know. Your area of expertise. Even though I'm far from an expert on cryptids or the paranormal, I know my fair share of information, more than anyone else in this group. It's highly unlikely we'll see anything unnatural, you know. i never seen anything at this campsite, and even if there was something, it's a million to one we'll run into it. We're actually more than likely to run into a druggie, or a pervert. Speaking of which, do we all have our phones? And we also remember the buddy system, right? Okay, mom, replied Kyle, rolling his eyes. I just want to keep everyone safe, I responded, suppressing a smile. There was another pause until Teresa leaned to continue the questions. Seriously though, even if it's unlikely we'll see anything, what do you think is out there? I decided I would refrain from scaring my friends for long enough. Well, it's the forest, so you'll never know. 
my best guess would be some kind of crawler, a flesh gate, or stick man, or something like that. Of course, normally, my first thought would be a skinwalker or wendigo, but I believe those are only in America. Some kind of dogman might be possible. We might actually see a Dior. Hold up, hold up. Back up the bus, said Kyle. You're acting like I know all of those words. Yeah, he's right, said Sam. What on earth is a Dior? Well, it's basically a deer. But something's not right. Too many joints in the legs, or even the legs, are bent backwards. Sharp teeth with a mouth that hangs open like a dog's. I even heard of some that can bend their neck with a joint. Kyle shivered. I think the creepiest thing about them, though, is their eyes. They're set in front of their faces, instead of the sides like a normal deer's would be. A lot of reports, however, say that they're pretty harmless. Just because they could rip you into pieces doesn't mean that they want to. Almost like my dog Brute, I suppose. I reached into the back seat to pet Brute, who responded by licking my hand. Regardless, it's best to keep a distance. As soon as I finish, Teresa had a question. You mentioned flesh gates. What are those things? The sunlight was slowly starting to fade, so I flipped on the headlights before answering. Humanoids, you know. Pretty much covers anything that's more or less human shaped, but not quite yet. Some of them are tall, thin, often less facial features than you expect. Flesh gates are shapeshifters. Think about a skinwalker, but without the ties to Native American culture. And those things are real? And they're out there? Said Kyle with a concern on his face as he leaned a little closer to Brute. I suppose. All those sightings and reports, they can't come from nowhere. As for in this bush, specifically, I have no idea. But don't worry about it too much. As I said before, it's highly unlikely we'll see one. Kyle then nodded, still looking a bit concerned. Then Olive spoke from next to me, placing her hand briefly on my shoulder. As she did, my heart skipped a beat. I barely heard what she asked over my own minor panic, but after a second I was able to decipher what she asked. Is there anything paranormal that actually scares you? I took a deep breath before responding. I would be terrified if I ever actually came across one of those freaky bastards, but in terms of just talking, not really. It was pretty quiet after that. We reached the woods and we started down the old trail. My car easily carrying us over rocks, roots, and even across the occasional stream. Not long after the sun had fully set, all of a sudden, Kyle sat straight up. Did you see that? I slammed on the brakes and looked out the window at where he was pointing. Sure enough, the bushes were rustling. We stayed quiet, Olive leaning over me and looking out my window. Her closeness pulled me out of my focus for a moment before I returned my eyes to the rustling, which was quickly coming closer. The tension in the car was real, and I could see Kyle looking scared from the corner of my eye. Maybe I shouldn't have told him everything that I said, but before I could think about these things, a deer sprung from the bushes and leaped across the trail from in front of us. As it passed, I noticed one of its antlers seemed to have been snapped clean in half. Everyone jumped backwards in surprise at the sudden appearance of the deer. But once we saw what it was, we all started laughing. Wow, Kyle, that was really scary. A deer. Sam continued to tease, and Teresa and I joined in. Kyle just rolled his eyes. Whatever, guys. You were as scared as I was. It could have been a monster. Nah, don't think so. All its eyes and legs were in the right places, said Teresa. The only cryptid around here is Sam. I laughed and started up the vehicle, continuing on. However, at a quick glance, motion in the rear view mirror caught my attention. And as everyone was laughing, 
I think I saw something leap across the road. And something about the way it moved made me nervous. But when I tried to look closer, it was gone. I shook it off as a trick of my mind. It's not uncommon for my mind to play tricks on me. It has something to do with my anxiety. I easily put it out of my mind as I had trained myself to do and kept driving, talking with my friends until we reached the campsite. I pulled the tent out of the boot and marked where we should set it up. You four set up the tent. Why don't you have to help? Kyle asked. I just drove four hours, Kyle. I think I can delegate the chores. I'm useless at setting that thing up anyways. I turned to head into the tree line at the edge of the clearing, but was stopped again. Where are you going? Sam was asking. I'm gonna go get some wood and start up a fire. I set off into the trees, flicking on my flashlight as I did. I started picking up sticks, carefully inspecting each one for any small critters. As I turned one over, a small spider crawled out onto my hand. I smiled, crouched down, and gently put him on the soft ground. There you go, sir. When I stood up, that's when I noticed something strange. The night sounded quiet, somehow. The cicadas were still chirping, but something seemed almost mechanical about their sounds. I listened for nighttime birds or possums, but nothing reached my ears. This is weird, I said to myself. I quickly inspected a few more sticks and carried my bundle back to the campsite. By the time I returned, the sounds had returned to normal. I dumped the sticks into the center of the clearing between the four of them. My friends had managed to wrestle my family's giant tent into shape. My dog, Brute, was already snoring inside, apparently exhausted despite having done nothing all day. I pulled a matchbox from my backpack and started to light the fire. Once it had grown to a normal size, I stood up and walked over to the car. I grabbed my dog's bed and a bag of marshmallows from the boot and dropped it next to the logs. I then started to call him to come join us. He stiffly rose to his paws and lumbered over to it, accepting a pat on the head before flopping down onto his bed. I sat down on the log's end, spearing a marshmallow before throwing the bag to Teresa, who had actually sat next to me. We sat for a while, laughing and just talking. I reached down to check the time before remembering that I had already left my phone in the tent. Hey, does anyone have the time? I asked. Kyle put a hand into his pocket before freezing and slowly turning to me with a concerned look. Uh, Casey? What have you done, Kyle? Normally, he would always roll his eyes at me. But this time, he just continued talking slowly, as if trying not to get in trouble. I think I left my phone when we stopped for a piss. We had to stop for a bathroom break after the deer encounter about 10 minutes before we arrived to the campsite because my dog started whining and I didn't want to risk him doing his business on the seat. Uh, we'll get it first thing tomorrow, I said, shaking my head annoyed. Casey, it might rain and you know I don't have money to replace that thing. Can you just go back and have a quick check? I sighed. Fine, but if I get there and don't see it, I'm coming straight back. I briefly considered taking Brute, but I knew he wouldn't want to leave the warmness of the fire to follow me down a less maintained path. Just as I stood up, Kyle motioned for me to stop. You can't go alone. It's not safe. Maybe Olive could go with you. Bastard, I thought to myself. Even deep in the forest and in the middle of the night, he still has to try to set me up. If anybody should come, it's you. You're the one who dropped the bloody thing. He shook his head quickly. I got little legs, remember? I'll end up slowing you down, especially this late in the night. You know I'm right. Well, at least I'm glad you're finally admitting it, I said with another sigh. Olive, do you mind? She smiled and stood up. Of course not. Maybe we'll even see one of those things you mentioned earlier. Maybe, I replied with a grin. 
As we walked down the track, I kept my guard up, scanning the trees on each side for a sign of any people hiding in the night. Was I worried about something? Not really. Not only am I around 6'3", I'm pretty much built, especially for a 21 year old. And if I had to punch someone, let's just say it wouldn't be my first rodeo. However, I didn't want them getting the element of surprise. Maybe I am a little paranoid after all. The track was muddy and uneven and I had to slow my pace down a little bit so Olive could negotiate the dips and puddles. As we talked, I found myself starting to relax a little. I still kept my eyes and ears open, but something about her smile and laugh made me feel a little less nervous in the darkness. A few minutes before we reached the spot, we came across a small stream about a meter wide. Not wanting to get my shoes wet, I leaned over and turned around to where Olive was about to jump. I held out my hand to her, and she took it without even thinking twice. I helped her across the gap and she smiled. Thanks Casey, she said. Not a problem, I responded jokingly. She laughed and continued down the track, knowing I would catch up in a second. Once we finally arrived, I started to look around for Kyle's lost phone. I cast my flashlight beam around, hoping to catch a reflection of the phone's screen or the pink case that he kept it in. Olive was looking around the other side of the road her own beam bouncing around from the corner of my eye. When it stopped sharply, I turned around. Did you find it? I asked. Following the beam of her torch into the trees, she slowly shook her head. Uh, no. I thought I saw something in the trees. I raised my flashlight scanning the forest. No sign of movement. Well, let's go back, I said, starting to head back up the track. I don't think the phone's here anyways. She didn't argue, just nodded and followed my lead. Sensing how she was feeling, I gave her a smile and flipped my torch in the air, catching it and holding it like a weapon. Hey, don't be scared. I'll guard you from anyone out here. She giggled. Or anything. I nodded with a chuckle. But as soon as I said that, I felt a cold chill which actually brought my mind back to the cryptids and I noticed for the first time that the forest was silent. I couldn't hear rustling of small animals in the brush and the only thing my ears could pick up on was the same mechanical cicada chirps from before. The more I listened, the more unnatural they sounded, as if someone was playing a recording on loop. I picked up my pace a little ushering Olive to go faster. She looked at me confused, as if to ask why. It's actually starting to get a bit cold, I said, as quietly as I could without scaring her. We rounded a corner before Olive suddenly stopped us in our tracks. She inhaled a sharp breath of air, as if she seen something shocking. A sense of dread washed over me as I followed her gaze to the bloody body that blocked the path. Is that a deer? She asked, eyes wide with disgust and fear. I think it used to be, I replied. It was torn and mangled, almost beyond recognition, legs broken and its spine protruding from its back. I felt sick to my stomach, unable to tear my gaze from its lifeless eyes. The broken antler on its head confirmed what I had feared. This was the same deer as before. I knew I had seen something chasing it in the mirror. Whatever this thing was, it had been stalking us since we entered the woods, waiting for someone to leave the safety and light of the campsite. I cursed under my breath as I realized we might be in serious trouble. Just as I thought, I couldn't get any more scared. I heard a voice from behind me. There you go, sir. The voice, coming from a few meters behind us, was my own. It was distorted and strained, but unrecognizable. I felt the color drain from my face as I repeated what I had said to the little spider only hours before. I felt Olive start to turn beside me, but I grabbed her arms to stop her. Don't, 
look at it don't respond to it don't even acknowledge it look down if you can and just follow my lead okay i whisper waiting for her nod of agreement before taking a slow step ahead as i slowly stepped over the mangled body of the deer my shoes became splashed with its crimson blood olive grabbed my hand and i squeezed it careful not to look at the path behind us as i did she stepped over the deer and we slowly continue up the path every step we took we heard a crunching of leaves behind us my heart raced and my mind was filled with fear as i forced myself not to run into the trees i knew that whatever this thing was we couldn't outrun it after a couple of minutes it spoke again thanks casey the voice of olive coming from the trees i heard olive whimper as she listened to her own voice coming from whatever this thing was i squeezed her hand again making sure she knew i was right there we walked in tense silence other than the occasional words of the creature when we were only a couple of minutes from the camp disaster struck i tripped over a root landing hard on the ground as i felt a rock slice my skin the sudden movement seemed to excite the creature as i suddenly heard it pick up its pace considerably i leaped back to my feet and once again grabbed olive's arm before sprinting down the path run i yelled but she was already caught up to me my breath was quick and heavy with fear my legs screaming in pain as i forced it to bear my weight run 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 over and over as if it was playing with us which it most likely was run run i felt panic rise as i heard the calls coming even closer even if we're nearly to the campsite i knew we would never beat it run i veered off the path pulling olive with me we ducked down behind a bush a few feet from the path i heard it stop a few feet ahead and turn around sniffling to try to catch our scent I silently prayed to any and all the gods I could think of that it didn't find us. The disgusting sniffing grew closer until it finally stopped, inches from our hiding spot. Found it. The voice and the words were just the same as when I asked Olive if she found the phone. I knew it was telling us that it found us. For a few moments, there was a complete silence in the forest. Aside from my heart hammering into my chest and Olive's muffled sobs that she buried her face into my shoulder, there was nothing, no indication it had moved closer or further away. It didn't even bother to fill the silence with the fake cicada sounds it had tried to trick us with earlier. Suddenly, it leaped over the bush where we hid and stood before us. I finally saw it. Its arms and legs were long and thin. Its legs were bent backwards at the knees, like some kind of insect. Even on all fours, it was a solid five feet tall. I saw its ribs slide under its skin as it was breathing, its veins bulging with every beat of its unnatural heart. It tilted its head to the side, bones cracking under the skin as its neck bent like the joint of a finger. The antler of the deer hung from its jaws, caught between two of its needle-like teeth. Its teeth seemed to sprout at random from its gums, creating a jagged minefield of spikes and stumps. What I initially thought were just ingrown teeth or chunks of flesh quickly made me sick to my stomach, as I realized they were, in fact, human teeth among the fangs. Its tongue hung from the fleshy slit. I avoided eye contact for as long as I could, but eventually it grabbed my gaze like a fisherman, hooking its catch. Its eyes were completely human, so out of place on its pale expressionless face. In that moment, I knew I was going to die. I wrapped my arms around Olive for a moment before moving to stand. She tried to pull me back, but I was stronger, forcing my shaking legs to hold me upright. As a tear rolled down my cheek, I pulled my knife from my belt and held it just out of view at my side. Run, 
I said quietly to Olive. She hesitated, not wanting to leave me, but after a moment she did. The creature jolted to the side as if it was going to go after her, but I held its gaze and it slowly returned to how it was standing before. It crept towards me, sniffing at me through the holes in its face, which I assumed were its nostrils. The deer antler dislodged from its teeth and landed on the ground. This unholy mixture of human and animal continued to sneak towards me, and the moment it was within reach, I plunged my knife into its pale, moldy skin. It shrieked in pain, its horrific screech making my ears ring. It flung me into a nearby tree, knocking the wind from my stomach. It then creeped towards me, with its mouth parted in an enraged scream and I closed my eyes in preparation for the worse. Just as I felt its hot breath on my face, I heard loud barking from a few feet behind the creature. It spun around, and as it did, it moved enough to let me see what was happening. My dog, who had never so much growled at a passing cat, was snarling and snapping his teeth like some kind of mad dog. Before I fully realized what was happening, there was a disgusting squelch and the creature once again shrieked in agony. The antler from before was protruding from its left eye socket, black blood spraying from the wound as Olive stood over its body. Good thinking, I said, before leaping over it and making a beeline for the campsite. When we got back, the others had already packed everything into the car and were waiting for us. Teresa, who was in the driver's seat, honked the horn in recognition and Kyle flung the door open and leaped into the back row. Olive, Brute, and I pile into the middle seat, slammed the door, and Olive yelled at Teresa to step on it. We raced down the trail as fast as we could go without running the risk of crashing. With no warning, a figure sprung from the bushes and landed on the hood of the car. As it dented the metal, Teresa screamed and swerved the car from side to side, trying to dislodge the thing. It dug its long claw-like fingers into the vehicle and shrieked, raising one hand and scratching the windscreen. Teresa floored the accelerator and the sudden boost of speed sent the creature flying into the glass, cracking it as it did. And then it fell under the wheels of the vehicle. We mowed it down and didn't stop. Desperate to get out of there as fast as we could, I looked back in the rear view mirror and watched it as it popped its slime back into place and ran back into the bushes. Disturbing as it was, I didn't care. We were safe. Soon enough, we were free from the forest and heading back down the dirt road. As soon as we returned to the highway, Teresa went a different path and within an hour we had arrived at the nearest hospital. Olive and the others waited with me as the doctors disinfected the wound and stitched me up. Despite us being shaken to our very cores, we talked and even cracked a few jokes about the thing because, hey, what else can you do, right? Family members of all of us arrived a couple of hours later, armed with snacks and blankets for my friends and I. All of this happened a few weeks ago, in case you're wondering. The car was a bitch to get fixed, but other than that, I'm doing okay. Judging by all the therapy sessions that we are all going to, I think we're all doing better than before. There are things out there in the darkness, in the forest, waiting for you to go camping. One thing's for sure though, I'm never going into those woods again. So this is my first time sharing something like this through here, but I need to know if the things I have been seeing are like normal. And if they are, then how do I get this deer to stop looking through my window? I mean, I know some deer are pretty scary creatures and some of them like to scare people. I know that. Hell, 
I've been living in the mountains for several years. Never really liking nature too much. But I do prefer the solitary nature of living in a small community. And living in a house that is flanked with tall pine trees. Basically, I enjoy being private. But back to what's going on. Last night, I was sitting in my yard with my laptop. Working on some late classwork I had neglected for a few Netflix shows and a few drunken nights when a deer walked by. Nothing too out of the ordinary. And I had paused to watch this large buck walk through my yard. Normally, they don't seem to pay me much attention. But this time, as soon as it saw me, it just stared. I mean, it turned its head to look at me better. I waited to see if it would eventually walk away. But it didn't. It actually walked closer to me. Now, I'm not too versed in how to deal with deer, but I didn't see any females or any fawns. So I figure if I raise my voice, it would most likely leave or at least stop. It did stop when I yelled, but just for a split second. Then it kept walking closer and closer until it was about nine feet away from me. I finally decided that this was way too close and proceeded to yell, Hey, get the fuck out of here. And then, go home. Don't make fun of my attempts to get the buck to leave. I have only ever had to deal with a few of my neighbor's dogs getting into my yard. And by screaming at them to go home, gets them right on their way. But this buck was not a dog and actually didn't even listen. However, at this distance it didn't seem to want to get any more closer. So this was my chance to carefully collect up my phone and laptop, making sure to not make too many sudden movements, and made my way inside, making sure to not break eye contact. I really didn't want to get in a chase with the buck, especially if this buck had a head start when I wasn't looking. So I got inside, locked my doors, and made the executive decision that I was done studying and that I needed a beer and a few episodes of whatever show I could get to catch my interest. But when I grabbed the beer and looked out the window to my backyard, there was the deer's head staring through my window. This deer must have been standing on its hind legs to look in. I'm 5'10 and my head doesn't even reach, but there, this deer was. I could see a good portion of its neck and its entire head and its massive rack of horns. He just keeps staring through the window, making it pretty hard to get invested into any shows. It's been a few hours and he's not leaving. And I'm pretty sure he looked my window a few moments ago. I'll provide another update tomorrow. For now, this deer is scaring the shit out of me. I never told this story to anyone. And I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today. And this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house, but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced-in area was only a small part of the property. 
but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I already get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in, to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it. The dog also creeped me out, but you know, angry dog, and I was a kid, it happens. Now, I do get scared pretty fast, I always been that way. For example, I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing, just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over, his name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides. I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway, right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing, and he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room but I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear, but he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out, but it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. 
Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him, but when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer, and that's when he followed me, like right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um, in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway, unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom basically. None of them believe me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. And Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. So after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time. And I'm inclined to believe him. Because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down. But I'm a little rattled. But I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly... The dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said, the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's gonna wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there's absolutely no way I'm gonna go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open, and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates, 
I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall. In my mother's low voice. The same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by... Go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away but that one night still haunts me i still refuse to go out at night unless i'm with a bunch of people and i will never ever live in the woods again anyways i hope you all enjoy hearing about this as i probably won't tell the story again thanks for listening When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place, only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag labeled with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, 
An intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29th stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked him to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands try to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields and one at a time I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others, was a cow alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange, though, was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I wasn't eager to tell my boss they had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear, searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. 
I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it. But still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wondered. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again. But this time, it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself, wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak. A slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the eight foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupils seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body. Its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh, oh, oh. The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figured it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. It was late June of 1968. My dad was 12. 
My grandparents had moved a few months earlier from Tucson, Arizona to Concho, Arizona. Concho was very different, both in landscape and temperature. Sitting at 5,000 feet above sea level, the summer temperatures were around 70 degrees versus the hundreds in summertime Tucson. Resting at the edge of the White Mountains, the land is red, yellow, and brown sandstone cliffs and buttes against a larger ancient basalt flow ridge that lines the north from the Springville Volcanic Range. Well, Old Concho, as it's referred to now, sits among the high desert with large basalt ridge bordering the east and north. In the valley, a dry riverbed was dotted by large cottonwood trees. The buttes and ridges boasted large twisted cedar trees. Only about 200 people lived in Concho at the time. It's in pretty close proximity to the petrified forest. Therefore, petrified wood was found on the valley floor. There were also numerous ancient Anasasi ruins scattered along the valley. My great uncle had moved his family to Concho as well. My grandpa had recently finished his engineering degree and he and my great uncle were doing highway construction all around the White Mountains. They had both purchased land in the Concho area for pretty cheap. My great uncle had two sons who were a year older and a year younger than my dad, Tony and Sack. Tony was 13 and Sack was 11. They would spend their days exploring the surrounding landscapes, joined by my dad's American bulldog, Sarge. They had found quite a few ruins, numerous pictographs, and some old abandoned homesteads, most likely from the 19th century. Every morning, they would load up their bags with canteens, bologna sandwiches, and head out into the wilderness to play and explore. My grandparents and great aunt and uncles had only one rule that was for the children, and that was to return by sunset. As my dad recalls on one summer morning, they ended up hiking towards the edge of the giant basalt ridge to explore. After going for about a mile or so, they came upon an arroyo running adjacent to the ridge. Large black boulders and giant slabs of sandstone peppered the wash. The banks were pretty steep, but they would have to cross it if they want to explore the ridge on the other side. They made their way down slowly. Once in the arroyo, they realized that the opposite bank was too steep to climb. So they started following it west to find a better place to climb up. My dad said as soon as they got into the riverbed, he started getting an unnerving feeling, like they were being watched. He said it was extremely quiet, no birds or cicadas chirping. It was hot as well, no breeze stirred the air. The further they walked down the wash, the more a sense of urgency began to build in his gut. He didn't say anything though, for fear that his cousins would laugh at him. About a half mile or so down the wash, it made a bend around a large volcanic boulder. Suddenly, Sarge began a low growl, hair standing up on his back. This actually startled all three of the kids. Looking around, they didn't see anything, so encouraging the dog, they moved closer to the bend. Sarge stayed rooted to the spot, growling and barking. All three of the boys began to get scared. They agreed that maybe they should just turn around. They noticed that there was a spot where they could climb out of the wash. They hadn't noticed it at first, but it looked almost like a game trail. With adrenaline fueling them, they hauled ass up the side of the embarkment towards the ridge. The dog darting after them. The whole time the bad feeling was growing stronger with my dad. They stopped at the top to catch their breath. Sitting against a large boulder, they took some drinks from the canteen and assured each other that Sarge probably smelled a coyote or spotted a rabbit. Here, the game trail was more apparent. 
It had even worn into some of the volcanic and sandstone that protruded from the ground. They noticed that there were a lot of petroglyphs dotting the black rocks, geometric shapes, animal, human figures. There were so many. Finally, they found a large juniper with a trunk and ate their lunch in shade. Bellies full and excitement replacing fear. They hurried along the trail as it slowly sigged and sagged the side of the basalt ridge, avoiding large areas of rock falls. The pictographs began to change as well along the trails. Lots of spirals and horn looking men. My dad even said there was one that looked like a UFO. Turning around a bend, the trail disappeared. Only open space of the edge of a cliff. There was nowhere else to go. The cliff dropped off to one side and a sheer cliff going up about 50 feet on the other side. My dad, he was disappointed, but also a little relieved as the sun was getting further west and they were pretty far from Concho now. They could see the town in the distance as well as the holy mountain and mesas that dotted the distant Navajo Res. Even though they were disappointed, they decided that it was worth looking at the view. They started making their way down the trail when they spotted an opening in the cliffside, a side canyon. They hadn't noticed it on the way up. It was behind a large twisted cedar. The tree's shadow had hidden it. It looked almost like there was another trail going into the divide. The opening was about four feet wide. Looking at it, that unnerving feeling returned to my dad. His stomach dropped and he felt like it was twisting in knots. The hair on the back neck stood up. Tony suggested that they should detour and check it out. My dad protested saying that they needed to get back. Zack stayed silent. He looked as scared as my dad felt. Tony laughed when looking at them and called them both sissies. He said if they didn't want to go, it was fine that they could wait there for him and be babies if they wanted. That's when Sarge ran down the trail and was out of sight. My dad whistled for him, but he didn't return. Zack decided he would follow Tony, so my dad stayed behind while they entered the narrow black walled canyon. When they moved out of my dad's field of vision, the wind picked up blowing through the canyon and trees, making a creepy sound. It was quiet except the wind, and my dad thought he heard faint voices on the air. He shivered, the ominous feeling growing stronger. 10 minutes passed, then 20, and still, Tony and Zack had not returned. A large cloud had covered the sun, and drops of rain began to fall. My dad moved under the cedar, to get out of the light rain that began to fall. He sat on a rock and began to shiver. Suddenly, something grabbed his shoulder. He jumped about three feet and screamed. Then he heard laughing. It was Tony and Zack. They looked extremely excited. Luke, you'll never believe what we found. They said, we found some Indian steps and they lead to a cave. They begged my dad to come see. It wasn't far, only about 10 minutes into the canyon. My dad ended up following them, knowing they weren't going to agree to go home until they showed them. Plus, he felt a little braver and more intrigued now. Sure enough, around a bend and about 20 yards into the canyon, the canyon was more wide, about 20 to 30 feet across, and there were indeed foot and handholds carved into the rock wall. My dad had seen steps like them before when his parents had taken him to Chaco Canyon National Park. They were smaller than the ones in Chaco and only went up about 20 feet to the darkened mouth of a small cave. He shivered from excitement or fear. He wasn't sure. From the bottom of the canyon, there was no way of telling how large the cave was. They dropped their packs and decided to use the foot and handholds to climb up to the cave against my dad's better judgment. The rain had stopped, but they slowly and carefully 
made their way because the rock had become slick. It took about 10 minutes to ascend. My dad called for Sarge from the top again, and the dog still hadn't returned. The cave was much larger and deeper than they expected, and the entrance was decorated with hundreds of petroglyphs. The light didn't penetrate very far in, but they could see light in the distance from an opening in the roof, so they entered. Light adjusting to the dark, they started to notice that the ground was covered with objects. What looked like rocks and debris now revealed itself to be pots, beautiful painted pots of all shapes and sizes, black on white, painted with geometric patterns and animals, red pots and even some yellow ones, large pots holding dry corn and crusty squash and beans. There were also pots filled with arrowheads and beads. They even found some instruments like drums and flutes. They didn't touch anything and kept walking deeper into the cave. They looked around in shock and in awe. They had just discovered something big. Something very big. They moved now towards the second bit of light streaming in from a crack in the roof. The cave was littered with all sorts of artifacts, stone axes, pots of all shapes, colors, and sizes. As they passed under the crack, they noticed now that there were objects and alcoves in the wall. My dad moved closer to one and his blood froze. He was looking at a human body. It was decayed skin and hair clinging to patches and its mouth open and what looked like a silent scream. He took a leap back. Tony and Zack also froze. The walls were lined with alcoves filled with dressed bodies, lining the walls as far as they could see into the darkness. Suddenly, an ominous and horrendous screech broke the silence of the cave. All three boys jumped, and my dad looking in the direction from where the sound came saw two red and glowing eyes. He froze locked in place by those glowing red eyes. Suddenly, the cave was washed over with the stench of decay and death. The eyes began to move towards the boys. Slowly, another hideous growl, screech, jolted them from being petrified in place. The eyes were moving fast now, right towards them, and they heard what sounded like running footsteps. They turned and tore out of the cave as fast as they could. They ran as fast as their legs could carry them in a blind panic. The entrance to the cave was maybe 30 yards away. My dad looked back against his better judgment and saw a man on all fours or a giant coyote. He can't be sure. He pushed himself faster, screaming for the others to also run faster. They reached the edge of the cave having to turn around to scrabble back down the foot and handholds. Zack got there first and began descending as fast as he could. Tony was next. His face turned into a wash of horror as he went down. My dad's heart was hammering into his brain by now. He turned and saw the eyes only about 20 feet from him. The stench of decay was overpowering. It made his stomach turn. As fast as he could, he placed his feet in the first set of footholds and started clambering down the rock face. He could hear the creature's breath now and even feel it. He refused to look up as he was going down, trying to concentrate on the hand and footholds. He heard Tony scream from below him and looked to see Tony lose his hold and slip about five feet from the bottom. He landed on his side and began to scream with pain. My dad slowed himself a bit, still not daring to look back up. After what seemed like an eternity, he leaped from the cliffside down the last two feet. Zack was helping Tony to his feet, and Tony was frozen looking at the cave and ancient staircase. All the color gone from his face. My dad was in full panic, and not looking, grabbed Tony and helped Zack drag him away. They flew down the little canyon 
Finally, before they passed the turn, my dad looked back to see the red eyes watching them from the darkness. Another screech rang from the cave, and at that moment, Sarge and a full run came from around the bend, growling and barking. He ran to the foot and handhold staircase and bellowed up that cave, the hair on his back standing straight up, snarling and growling. The sounds of the dog filled the canyon. As my dad turned the corner, he saw those red eyes retreat back into the cave. They emerged from the small canyon and stopped briefly to catch their breath. The sounds of Sarge barking and growling echoing down the canyon. Tony at this point was now crying, his face washed with pain. His arm, he said. He thinks he broke it. Zack was silent. My dad was then asking Tony if he could make it home. Tony responded. He sure the hell wasn't staying anywhere near whatever that was. Suddenly, a shrill cry came from the canyon. It was a dog in pain. Sarge, my dad cried. But Tony and Zack had started running down the trail. My dad screamed again, tears coming from his eyes. There was no response. It was quiet. My dad thinks he hears something. He looks up to the canyon entrance. It sounds like drums. My dad sits there confused. Drums? What the hell? Is he losing his mind? The drums are getting loud. Is this in his mind? Where is Sarge? He can't leave him. My dad sees Zack tearing back up the trail. Luke, we have to go. The drums are louder now and he can hear faint chanting. Zack grabs my dad and jerks him to his feet. Don't you hear that? He screams and shakes my dad. We have to run, now. My dad is woken from his grief as fear washes over him again. He runs down the trail with Zack. Tony is waiting at the edge of the arroyo, waiting for them. The wash is now running, about six inches deep. They notice for the first time that a large thunderhead has developed to the south. A huge large black storm dominating the southern horizon, lightning flashing in the distance. A new source of danger crosses my dad's mind. He tells Tony and Zack they need to cross the arroyo as fast as possible. If it floods, they will be stuck on the side with the basalt ridge with whatever that thing was. They make their way down carefully and slowly. Tony is having a hard time because of his injured arm. They now start hearing thunder rolling across the air and the wind has increased. My dad is keeping a close eye on the creek which has only risen a couple of more inches. They make all the way down and across the creek. The place where they crossed is only 30 yards or so ahead so they scrabble their way towards it. The water starts rising now at an alarming rate. They start going as fast as their legs will carry them. They're exhausted but keep pushing on. Suddenly, my dad who is in the rear starts to hear loud splashing coming from behind him. His heart drops. It followed them. It's getting closer. He closes his eyes bracing for impact. That's when he feels something lick the back of his swinging hand. He turns bracing for impact and sees Sarge. Joy fills my dad. He bends down and gives Sarge a quick hug as the dog runs past and the dog bounds after Tony and Zack as they climb out of the arroyo. My dad runs and begins to climb. When he's almost to the top, he hears crashing and loud snapping coming from the arroyo. Making it to the top, he sees a wave of brown debris, filled water crash through the wash. He falls to his butt and watches as the flash flood fills the little canyon. Tony and Zack are lying on the ground, gasping for air. My dad tries to catch his breath. He feels dizzy. He feels tears welling up and Sarge comes and licks his face. My dad sees that Sarge is covered with blood. He looks over the dog and finds several slash wounds on his back. His ear is also torn. They don't look too deep, but he can't be sure. Zack is the first to speak. 
He is asking what it was, but no one responds. Tony's arm is beginning to swell pretty badly, and it's only a few hours till dusk. They're all thirsty, and realize in their panic, they left their packs in the small canyon, along with their canteens. They are no longer in a hurry. They are exhausted. They drink some rainwater that has pooled in one of the large sandstone boulders. They figure whatever that thing was, it's not going to be getting across the arroyo for a few hours. So they slowly make their way back to Concho as the thunderhead to the south continues to fill the landscape. The three boys and Sarge make it home around 8. The sun has set and my grandparents and great uncle and aunt are worried sick. They are relieved and angry until they see the condition of the trio and the dog. The boys tell them about their horrendous tale and Tony's parents rush Tony to the nearest doctor. That night, my dad sleeps with Sarge at the end of his bed. Despite him being extremely exhausted, he is plagued with nightmares. One that he speaks about all the time is especially terrifying, where he sees the red eyes looking in through his window. When he wakes up though, in the morning, his curtains are closed. The rain continued for two or three days. The boys don't leave their homes, still terrified of what happened. My grandpa and great uncle are convinced what the boys encounter was a mountain lion, but they are intrigued by the story of the cave they found. A few days later, when the weather is clear, they tell the boys they want to see the cave. They make the journey faster this time, using my great uncle's jeep. My grandpa and great uncle also bring along a couple of shotguns and rifles in case this lion is still in the cave. The boys show them the arroyo which has been filled with new boulders and broken trees from the flooding. They find a trail and start making their way up. My grandpa on the front and great uncle taking the rear. They find the boys packs caught in a cedar bush. They have been shredded. My grandpa figures they must have been caught by another flood and they ended up in the trees. They finally make it to the little hidden canyon which has been blocked by a juniper that washed down during the rain. My grandpa and great uncle get the log out of the way and they go to the canyon to the Indian staircase. When they look up though, they can make out the darkness of the cave. The water washed away all signs of the boy's previous passage. My grandpa figures maybe at this time of day, the cave is more illuminated. So he and my great uncle climb up the foot and hand holds to the top. The boys wait at the bottom, having no desire to go back up there again. It's only my dad and Zach. Tony with his broken arm stayed home. My grandpa calls down for them to climb up. They do as they are told and climb up. When my dad reaches the top, he is stunned. The cave is gone. It's only a 20 foot rock alcove next to a black basalt cliff covered with petroglyphs. He's confused, looks around. He goes over to the wall looking for cracks and sees nothing. My grandpa and great uncle end up questioning the boys. Were they making up stories? No, they weren't. Something attacked Sarge, and the boys hadn't made up being that scared. The dads aren't mad. It's a neat area. Maybe some other weekend they will look for the cave again. My dad and Zach know that this is where the cave was. There's no doubt in their minds. They found their packs and even passed by the UFO petroglyph. But they can't convince the adults. So they make their way to the jeep that is parked on the far bank of the arroyo. As they load up, sun sinking low in the western sky. My dad looks back at the black basalt ridge, wondering if maybe it was all just a dream, but something in the shadow of a cliff catches his eye. He squints against the sun and sees two red shining eyes looking back at him. His blood goes cold. He turns around as the jeep pulls away. My grandparents only stayed in Concho 
for another few months. As soon as my grandpa finished the highway project, he got a job offer in the U.S. Virgin Islands. My dad said after that encounter, he had nightmares every night and would swear that at night he would see the red eyes outside of the house until they finally moved from Concho. After he moved, he never had a nightmare about the eyes again. But it wasn't his last encounter with the red-eyed creature. He would see it again when he became an adult. But that is a story for another time. There are things out there in the woods at night that we, as humans, should not disturb. This is my first time publicly telling this story. It almost sounds like the generic monster in the woods story, but I've been holding on to it for a few years now, and I'm finally ready to tell it. I live in the hill country of Texas, and this event happened back in August of 2018. I promise you, it's true. As anyone in Texas can tell you, August is very hot. The summer is what I like to call Diet August. And for good reason. I worked as a maintenance tech for a school district, so the heat and manual labor were my best friends. One of my buddies called me one day around lunchtime, and he told me there was a problem at his family's ranch. Apparently, one of the horses had gotten loose and ran off the evening before and hadn't returned. So he asked me if I could help look for it. It was Friday and I didn't have any plans. So a trip to the ranch sounded like a great way to spend the weekend. A few hours later, I got another call. This time, I was told they found a horse, but it was dead and that now we would go hunting for whatever killed this horse. For those that don't know, there aren't that many apex around here. Plenty of coyotes and wild pigs, and very rare, a mountain lion. But that's about it, unless someone has some exotic stuff on their land. One time, I saw a zebra chilling under a tree while driving down some back road. When I got off work, I went home and got changed into some hunting clothes and prepped my gear. At the time, I had an SKS, which actually worked fine. Ammo was very cheap. I assumed that we would need some quick follow-up shots, so I know it would do the job. With a big sharp knife to hang on my belt, I felt ready for whatever would happen. My friend picked me up, and we drove for about two hours before we finally arrived at his family's ranch. The ranch was beautiful. Thick forest, rolling hills, and a lot of wildlife. The basic layout was the main house situated down a dirt road that took several minutes to navigate, so it was set pretty far from any roads. About a hundred yards from the house was the barn where most of the equipment was kept. A couple of ATVs and a cool little side-by-side -side that was always a blast to drive. There was a field where the horses were kept, but aside from that, the area was just wild land. Trails had been cut so many times that they formed very reliable means of exploring. When we got out of the car and got my stuff unloaded, I was told we were waiting on a couple more people to show up. Fine by me, the more the merrier. In the meantime, I was told to go to the barn and see what was left of the horse that had been retrieved from the forest. The scene that I saw was not something I expected, even though I really didn't know what I was expecting to see. It was torn to ribbons. Deep slash marks covered the body. The stomach was torn open and I could see tooth marks where something had taken bites, but it didn't seem like it had been fed on. More like demolished than a fit of rage. That ruled out coyotes instantly. If a pack was strong enough to take this horse down, they would have done their best to pick it clean. It also couldn't have been pigs. There were no signs of injury on the lower legs. 
That left us with some maniac roaming the woods or a mountain lion. The lion, rare as they might be, looked like the culprit. It actually broke my heart, thinking that we would have to kill it. To be honest, I would rather find a way to remove it and take it somewhere safe. But if it's taking down horses, it would have no problem taking down a human. The sun was slowly getting lower in the sky when the other guy showed up. I won't use their names of course, but there were four of us. We discussed options for something and decided that a grid search using maps of the ranch would be our best bet. However, with so much land to cover, we would each take an area to sweep. Every 10 minutes, we would have a radio check to make sure we were safe. One of my favorite things about coming here was that there was some pretty awesome stuff we could use for our shenanigans. Tonight, we would have sets of night vision goggles. I chose the one with the head mount so I could have one eye available to see normal. One thing about using night vision is the lack of depth perception and I'm not keen on tripping over every bump on the ground. We chose our grid to search, checked our gear, tested the radios, and off we went. By our third radio check, I was finally in place to start looking. I took out the map, used my compass to situate myself, and picked the direction to walk. The sun was real low by now, and was already near pitch black under the canopy of oak and cedar trees. With the night vision over my eye, I was creeping through the brush, trying my best to make as little noise as possible. From the sound of it, I was the only creature being quiet. The forest was teeming with all the craters beginning their nightly activities. Raccoons, possums, cottontails, and jackrabbits. Of course, you can't forget about the bugs. The constant chattering of cicadas mixed with crickets and whatever else is out there made noise that gave the area an almost deafening feeling. Slowly I scanned the area with the night vision, rifle in the low ready position. Two radio checks went by when I suddenly realized that the woods had gone quiet. Standing alone at night in a forest that no longer has any noise is a scary thing. Generally, animals will go quiet when danger is nearby. The problem was Nothing seemed to care about my presence, and now there was dead silence. I made my way to a clearing and found a tall hill. It looked like a good point to get my bearings, so I climbed a fairly steep slope. At the top, I had as close to a commanding view as one could hope when surrounded by tall trees. In any way, I was about maybe 20 to 25 yards from the tree line. The sun was down with the last glimmer of purple and red sinking below the horizon. Navigating was about to get a bit more difficult. Using the night vision, I tried to pick out any landmark I could see to figure out where I was on the map, swinging my head around. I caught a reflection of eyes in the trees. They were big and bright and unblinking. I stared for a moment deciding what I should do. I could see pretty well in the clearing thanks to the moonlight, but in the tree line was pitch blackness. I called out to the eyes, trying to get whatever it was to move so I could see it better. I could tell it was taller than a deer or basically anything else that lived there. So I thought it was a person. Suddenly, I was really wishing it was a mountain lion a horse mutilating cycle was not what I wanted on my hunting bingo card. I called out and said, Hey, this is private land. You need to leave right now. Nothing happened for maybe 30 seconds. When I heard the eye speak, it said, Leave right, right now. In a perfect impression of my voice, as though it was recording. Safe to say, that was extremely unsettling. I raised my rifle and said, if you don't leave right now, you're gonna die. As soon as I said that, 
The eyes lifted as though they had stood up. The height from my best guess was maybe seven or eight feet, depending on how tall the tree next to it was. Then, it moved, stepping out of the darkness and into view of my night vision. It repeated my words again, saying, If you don't leave right now, you're gonna die. For a moment, I was in shock. This thing looked sickly white, maybe gray. It had a long and slender frame. Without a second thought, I pulled the trigger and fired. How I ended up missing at this distance was a mystery to me. But I fired again, and this time the bullet struck home. The creature let out this monstrous, unnatural well like a mountain lion scream, mixed with what sounded like an air horn. I was stunned, nearly paralyzed with the most primal sense of fear I have ever experienced. Then it took a step towards me. I fired again, and again, and again, emptying my entire magazine of 20 rounds, but it still kept walking. If I hit it, I didn't know because it hadn't screamed again. Without taking my eye off of it with the night vision, I fumbled to eject the magazine and was reaching for another when it stopped walking maybe a yard from me. The creature stood there staring at me it didn't have any hair and its skin looked as though it was merely wrapped tightly around bone with no muscle or definition the eyes were small despite having a massive reflection in the ir there was a line that i guess was most likely the mouth i stood there not knowing what to do it raised its hand towards me and then i saw the fingers there were four fingers long and black, tapering down to something like an ice pick. That's when the smell hit me. It was like hot vomit, with the odor of decay and feces. In my brain, I knew I had to get away from it, but I physically couldn't move. Just before the fingers made contact with my shoulder, there was this moment of clarity and I was able to move with a fluid motion. I dropped my rifle from my hands, falling across my chest and being caught by the sling, and with my right hand I drew out the knife. I slashed upward. I ended up slashing up from the creature's right hip towards the left shoulder. It screamed and took a step back. This was my moment to run. I stepped backwards and fell down the side of the hill, rolling as I tried to not drop the knife and keep my rifle from being too damaged. At the bottom, I rolled to my feet and took off in a flat sprint, crashing through the brush like a train. I could hear heavy steps behind me. I knew if I looked back, I would most likely die. So I just kept running and trying to avoid hitting a random branch as they briefly came into view in the night vision, which had somehow stayed on my head. I'm not the strongest runner, but fear and adrenaline are excellent motivators. I came out of the forest and directly into the other three guys as they were on their way to me. They started yelling and asking what happened as I screamed, just fire away, as I tried to recover. They took my word for it and began shooting into the trees, emptying their mags on their two AR-15s and one AR-10. As their rifles became empty, they helped pick me up from the ground and we started running down the trail and back towards the house. After what felt like forever running, we flew into the house and locked the door. We kept shifting our eyes to each other and out the nearest window. Once we felt like we had the air to talk, I explained what happened. They told me they heard the shots and started heading towards my direction, thinking I had found a mountain lion or somehow got injured trying to signal for help. It was then that I realized I had likely dropped the radio when I fell down the hill because they said they tried getting me on their radios but I hadn't answered. It was only after I finished talking that my friend, whose family owns the ranch, said that they had heard strange things before but never tried to investigate. None of us got any sleep that night, keeping watch out the four sides of the house with rifles loaded and ready. Lucky for us, nothing happened. 
and we got ready to leave once the sun crested the horizon. The drive home was uneventful and without much conversation. When I got home, I immediately undressed and just took a moment to stare in the bathroom mirror. I had a handful of scrapes and scratches that I hadn't even noticed. My back was sore and my right ankle felt a little sharp. That shower was one of the greatest feelings I had ever had. And when I was done, I collapsed on my bed and was instantly asleep for the next 15 hours. Coming face to face with that monstrosity was definitely the scariest moment of my life. And I haven't returned since then. It took over a year to finally get comfortable with being in the woods again. Even though I still get a sinking feeling whenever I see the sun setting. What was it? I don't know. And quite frankly, I'm not interested in finding out. But if we meet again, I'll be sure to have plenty of bullets and a sharp knife with me. We had a tradition of going to see my grandfather every summer and spend some time at his cabin. The cabin by a lake and older than he is. The cabin is a load of fun for a child spending their carefree summer. The one thing I disliked about the cabin was there was no indoor washroom. A shower was set up outside. An outhouse a few steps off into the woods was the worst thing about the cabin. I hated using that thing. Bugs always took over the inside and I had a fear of something reaching up to grab me if I sat down. We begged my grandfather to get indoor plumbing. He only got a tub hooked up but his water heater can only handle so much. So we were banned from using it in the summer. The place was just barely held together. It would be cheaper to buy a new cabin than to renovate it. But we still went every year, always forgetting the negatives until we finally arrived. Even my father complained about the outhouse and he never really complained about anything. My grandfather also had a rack of hunting rifles and one shotgun. He told all of us to never touch them and to respect the weapons. He left the cabinet they were inside locked, his guns unloaded, and the ammo hidden somewhere in the cabin. He took no chances with the guns around a bunch of kids. He always said he would whoop some ass if he ever saw us touching them and told us it was because he loved us and didn't want an accident to happen. I asked why he kept the guns. I didn't see him using them very often aside from shooting a deer or two. I would see him go off into the woods while we swam with a rifle on his shoulder, but he normally never came back with some animal he shot. I don't think he would kill something to waste, leaving it behind, or that I think he was a bad shot. He may walk slowly, but his eyesight was better than ours. He always knew what might be going on. One time, my cousin found a cigarette someone dropped near the corner store where we sometimes got ice cream snacks. He kept it hidden for a day. When he thought that the coast was clear, he used one of the lighters for the fire pit. He didn't even take a drag before our grandfather came out yelling at him, scaring us all to death. With three kids crying, begging him not to tell our parents. He gave us mercy. As long as we cleaned the boat we've been putting off all weekend. Overall, my grandfather was a scary man. One night, after telling each other ghost stories to freak each other out, the worst thing happened when everyone else was dead asleep. I needed to use the restroom. I hated going out at night. It might be only a few steps and yet it felt like a mile walk. Things croaked off in the woods, which were perfectly normal noises for a forest. When you're a kid, full of ghost stories and listening to these things, those noises turned into killers and ghosts waiting to scoop you up. I went through the cabin to the back door, knowing that I couldn't hold it until morning. There was a flashlight by the door. I turned it on only to have it flicker off. It was the kid's job to make sure the flashlight had new batteries. Sometimes we switched them to out the good ones in the shared Game Boy for a few more hours of playtime. 
it finally came back to bite us. However, since the full moon was out, I had taken the path a hundred times before, so I went on without the flashlight. I feared what my grandfather would do if I woke him up trying to find new batteries. Slipping on my shoes, I went off in the backyard and down the short path to use the washroom. I heard a noise and I looked over my shoulder and walked faster fearing what might be looking at me in the dark. That was a mistake. Going without a flashlight and not paying attention to where I was going could have killed me that night. The longer I walked, the more afraid I was. It should not take this long to get to the outhouse. Another crack of a twig made me jump. I could no longer hold it and needed to step off the path to do my business and carry on. I hated going to the washroom out in the woods. At least it was quick and I was back on the path towards the cabin. But was I? Nothing looked right. The trail appeared too overgrown. I didn't understand how I had gone so far off the path. In my mind, I went the right way the entire time, and I only got lost when I stepped aside. Fear nearly froze me to the spot, forcing my body to move. I started going down where I thought I had came from, praying to find the path again. At this point, I called out for someone to come and get me. A sound came, and I shut my mouth heart beating so fast that it hurt. I looked around trying to see what was stalking a poor scared kid in the dark. Something flew at me. Wings flapping and a screeching cry made me snap. That's when I ran, screaming, trying to get away from whatever this thing was. Only when I stopped running and was very lost, I realized I just got scared by a bat. Just a normal, harmless bat. I wanted to cry, unless someone noticed I wasn't in my sleeping bag when they woke up to go to the bathroom as well. No one would know I was missing until morning. How long would it take until someone did notice? I skipped breakfast pretty often. They might even assume I was just sleeping in. I didn't want to stay out in the woods overnight. Having no other options or ideas of what to do while lost, I kept walking while trying to force back my tears. I had forgot it was best to stay in one spot while being lost in the woods. Just going deeper in them wasn't the best idea. I felt cold, scared, and was getting bit by bugs. My heart almost broke over the idea of being out there forever, starving to death and no one ever knowing what happened. Thinking back to the books I needed to read in school. I wonder if I could live out in the woods until they found me. If I find clean water and could figure out how to make a fire, I might be able to. The issue being, I never actually started a fire without a lighter. I tried with sticks, but it always took too long, and we always gave up. Me and my cousins loved burning things and were impatient. There was always a lighter to use. I wanted to try and find the cabin until the sun rose. If I still was in the woods by tomorrow night, I would buckle down to figure out how to make fire. Wait, wouldn't someone smell the smoke and find me sooner? Or would I burn the entire forest down? Getting motivated, I started to look for a clearing that I could use for a fire pit. It took a while, but I found a spot where the ground looked to be mostly dirt. It took longer to find a stone I could use to start digging out a hole in the dirt for my fire pit. My hands cold and the rock cut into my fingers a few times. Then, I needed to find the right sticks to get the fire started. And then finally, get enough wood to keep it going if I did get one started. I didn't go out of sight of the clearing, as I collected what I needed. Exhausted by the time I thought I was ready, my pit was filled with dry leaves and small sticks. I sat down ready to try to get a fire started. I used two sticks I peeled the bark off at first. My hands became raw from rubbing them together. Frustrated, I didn't think I could get them warm enough from the friction to get anything started. I then tried the rock method. I didn't know if any rocks would do, 
Or if my grandfather had a special type in his fire starting kit. A miracle of the night happened when I found the right rocks to smash together. One spark caught and I nearly fainted when the leaves burned and yet didn't catch fire. I kept trying until I had a very small flame that I actually fed with my breath. i never been so proud of myself in my entire life. The smoke blew into my face causing me to cough and ice water. Still very happy for my very small fire though. There wasn't a way to tell how long I was out there for. The sun hadn't even risen yet, so at least a few hours. As I warmed myself by the flames, I heard something. Off in the distance of the woods. I heard it. Again. My chest got tight with hope when I recognized that the noises I was hearing were human voices. No one I knew, but still someone out here in the woods with me. With my fire still going, I would be able to see my way back to the clearing if needed. I hurried off towards the voices so happy I couldn't speak. Mine. Mine. The voices were a warning for the person they were speaking with. It sounded... strange. As if English wasn't their first language. Still, it was someone who could help. At least, that's what I thought. Rushing into another clearing, all my excitement faded when I saw what belonged to those voices. A dead, torn to pieces deer sat in the middle of the small clearing, blood soaking the grass and leaves. In the clear moonlight, I saw three pale things, figures, all hunched over in the deer, tearing in with their hands and teeth. All their limbs were skinny and far too long for their bodies. Each of them were pushing aside each other, trying to eat as much of the deer as they could. Skin pale and drawn tight against their bones. Faces covered with blood. Each of them bald, with a mouth far too large for their face. And their eyes, oh god, their eyes were missing. Each of them had black empty sockets. None of them noticed me, that is until I let out a scream. All three heads darted up. Now knowing there was some fresh prey, I turned to run. Sounds from behind me said they were all starting to chase me. Tears came to my eyes making it nearly impossible to see where I was going. I slammed into a tree hard enough to hit my arm to the point I thought it was broken. I tumbled to the ground, crying in pain. My moment of weakness enough for one creature to get on top, limbs on either side. The head looking around trying to hear where I was, the large mouth opening, dripping blood on my tear stained face. The moment before the mouth filled with teeth tore my face off, a loud cracking sound echoed through the forest. The creature blown off, I screamed even more when a powerful hand grabbed my shoulder to drag me to my feet. Grandpa. I choked up when I saw him clearly through my wet eyes. He was holding a shotgun, ready to fire again. His face stern, not afraid or surprised of the creatures. I expected them to attack us. They somehow knew what the gun could do. Grabbing their dead, they dragged it deeper into the darkness. The moment they were out of sight, I heard the worst noise. Awful sounds of bones cracking and breaking. They were eating the one my grandfather had shot. It was all too much for me. I broke down crying. My grandfather silently bending over to pick me up in one arm. As he carried me through the woods, he stomped out my small fire on the way out. He didn't scold me for crying or getting lost. Him actually comforting me that night was the kindest moment we ever shared together. We arrived back by the time the sun was rising. My mother and father awake and worried out of their mind. They scooped me up when we arrived and I cried all over again. Before we left, I was able to get my grandfather alone to ask him what happened. Those things wouldn't bother us at the cabin. I only saw them because I went too far in the woods. Apparently he had a deal with them. 
that they were not to touch any humans as long as he fed them. And he also wasn't sure how many of them lived in the woods or even what they were. He also said that he fully understood if I didn't want to come back to the cabin next year. I almost didn't until he passed away of natural causes. I spent parts of my summer at the cabin. He wasn't able to get an indoor toilet, but he did mark the path to the outhouse with those solar charged lamps that people use in their garden to make sure that no one ever goes off the path again. The one and only time I went hunting was with my father when I was 11. My mom didn't work so it was up to him to provide for us. My entire life he worked more than he was at home. When he did come home, he would drink in front of the TV, too exhausted to do anything. The years crept up on him and he finally noticed how old I had gotten and how I was already shaping up to be a disappointment in his eyes. I was small for my age. I stayed inside a read instead of playing sports. My body was so frail I got sick often. When he finally truly looked at me for the first time, he didn't recognize the son that lived in his house. Therefore, he thought that hunting would be the answer. If I would man up and shoot something, maybe I might grow into the person he wanted. We never really spent any time together. Hunting with my father felt like being stuck inside a forest with a stranger. What kind of person even enjoys camping? Was I even missing something? My father kept sipping away at a steel water bottle that I knew didn't have water inside. Without it, he never would have lasted the day. We caught no fish at the lake for lunch the first day. Trying out luck, we went into the forest trying to shoot something for dinner. We packed something to eat, but not much. My father worked hard. However, he was supporting all three of us on his own. I knew it would be four of us soon. My mom hadn't told him yet, and I wasn't sure how he would take it. I really prayed she would leave him. As heartless as that was to hope for, we could go to my uncle's house so my father could be alone. Maybe retire in a few years without having to worry about supporting a family. Even as a child, I could see how much his job broke his body a little more every day. In my mind, my mother didn't have any kind of feelings for this stranger. Instead of going outside playing with neighborhood friends, I worried about my family's future. In the woods, Hunkered down, my father waited for something to come into his sight. For the first time, he made the attempt to talk with me and teach me things. After a while, when he thought I could be trusted, he placed the rifle into my hands and let me get into position. It was far too big for my short arms and little hands. I was scared that if I shot it, the recoil would break my shoulder. I didn't know the first thing about guns. In the movies I had seen they always had a powerful recoil. Line it up, our dinner is over there. My father whispered in my ear. A rabbit came into a clearing. He spotted it first, looking through the sight. I went through everything I had just learned. I only needed to pull the trigger. Such a simple little thing. My father would teach me more things patiently and be proud of me. The first hunting trip with his son would become a cherished memory, but it didn't go like that. I froze up. I just couldn't shoot the rabbit. Aside from not wanting to kill another living creature, I felt like if I shot it, I would be living a lie. My father would try his best to act like the person he should be, teaching me how to skin the rabbit and how to cook it, but he would not actually care about me. He never did. This trip would never turn into a family relationship he wanted. The small rabbit jumped off and out of sight to become a meal for something else. I eased up the grip on the rifle the moment before it was snatched from my hands. 
My father shot at the rabbit now hidden in the bush. Why didn't you shoot it? He hissed at me. When he got angry, his voice got low. He was never the type to yell and scream. I wonder if he did shout at me. I might be less scared of him. Whenever I had a nightmare, it was always the same. My father sitting in the living room in the dark, staring at the TV. I stood in the doorway looking at him, just waiting. The waiting crept dread into my bones. I hated the wait. I wish he would just finally scream at me. I couldn't stand his silent rage any longer. Go back to camp. You're useless. Those words should have done nothing to me. After all, this man wasn't my father. Not really. He was a stranger. And yet, I felt my face full of shame. But I still didn't regret not shooting the rabbit. I went back to the camp trying to make myself useful. I collected firewood. I cleaned up and did anything else that I thought would make my father happy. I heard the sound of a truck. We parked pretty close by and my stomach sank at the thought of him just leaving me here. But our gear cost a lot of money. He would leave his son in the woods but not things he worked hard for. For hours I was alone in the tent. I brought a book along. I nearly finished it by the time my father returned. He smelled drunk and like fast food. I knew he had gone into town for supper and a few drinks alone. I only ate a hot dog and a handful of marshmallows. The arrangement was fine by me. The rest of the night he spent by the fire, just drinking. The scene identical to how he spent time at home, just looking forward yet not taking anything in. He stayed outside even after night fell. I went back into our tent trying to sleep, finding it impossible. I thought about how things would change when my new sibling came if they ever made it to that point. I feared that my father would try to make sure that he didn't have another mouth to feed. I wanted nothing more to get away from that man, even though in a way, he had never done anything to me. The nothing made me feel as if something was coming. At some point I fell asleep, but some rustling outside woke me up. In my drowsy state, I sat up hearing my father's voice outside. Tate him please not me he was crying the man that i didn't know a thing about was crying his voice was very faint as if far away more begging and pleading until i heard something that made me scramble into the corner of the tent he finally broke the silence and the noise i always dreaded came he screamed and just kept screaming as if his life depended on it Clutching my knees to my chest, tears came to my eyes as I could do nothing but listen. Cracks from the rifle came. Whatever he was firing at, he missed. Or it didn't care. The entire exchange only took a few minutes that felt like years. Finally, his voice drifted away. As if he was being dragged at a fast pace. At first... I wanted to stay inside the tent until morning. I cried hard until my throat felt raw and my eyes hurt. When my crying spell stopped, I decided to see if he dropped the rifle. I would need a weapon until I could leave when dawn came. I unzipped the tent only enough to peek outside. The dying fire did not give enough light to see by. I needed to go outside. Finding a flashlight, I carefully got out hyper aware of every sound around me. Scanning the ground, I saw the hot dogs were still where I left them. If my father was attacked by a wild animal, why didn't they take these as well? Did the smell attract something and decided a full grown man would be a better meal? I saw no sign of the rifle, only tracks in the dirt where my father made his last stand. I felt sick because I realized he was coming towards the camp instead of the truck when he got snatched away. He was either trying to save me or wanted to use me as bait. Thinking the truck would be a better place to wait until the morning, I started to look around trying to find a trail towards it. I stopped when I heard a voice. Please, not me. 
help. It sounded so hurt and awful, but I knew that was my father calling out. For the first time in my life, he was trying to reach me. I abandoned the idea of the truck. I foolishly turned away and went towards the voice. For hours I walked in those woods getting hopelessly lost. I felt sick with fear. Anything could be in the dark and I only had a small flashlight to protect myself. Whatever took my father easily overpowered a full grown man. I didn't have a choice if it came across me. I would let my emotions take over and it might get me killed. Then again, I was only a child back then, so I shouldn't be too hard on myself. Please. Please. The voice came from close by, very low and raspy, but still my father's voice. I had been walking for hours at that point. My small body wasn't meant to move this much in the cold wet darkness. I knew a fever already coming and wasn't thinking clearly as I walked towards the voice. I didn't even consider it it may be someone else aside from who I wanted to find. Coming into a clearing, I started to look around with my flashlight. The small beam of light landed on something that made me choke on air. Someone killed a deer, skinned it, and hung it from a tree. In the darkness, that's what it looked like. I knew what a skinned deer looked like. It's what my mind wanted to see. The kill was so fresh, blood still dripped down onto the grass. I couldn't stop myself from starting to take a shorter and shorter breath when a whisper of a thought came to my mind that the body wasn't a deer. That's not him, I said out loud only to myself. That's not him. It's a deer. It's a small deformed deer with small legs. Unable to stop myself, I suddenly hunched over and threw up my meal from hours before, mostly bile that stung my throat. Seeing such a sight in the dark made me completely snap. Instead of screaming, I started to laugh on my knees alone lost and scared beyond words. Weak chuckles at first that turned into a cackling that soon turned into heavy sobs that locked up my chest. It's not him. I was sobbing holding myself not being able to look at the body in front of me. After getting another few glances between tears, I saw how different the legs were compared to what deer legs should look like. I only held on to some hope it wasn't my father skinned and hanging from a tree because I had just heard him a few minutes before entering the clearing. The kill was new, but skinning took a while, even if you knew what you were doing. In the next few moments, I saw why my hope was unfounded. I forced myself to stop crying when I saw a pale face in the dark on the other end of the clearing. The face looked at me through the trees, just beyond the skinned body. I opened my mouth to ask for help, but nothing came out aside from a croak. To my horror, the face came out of the trees with the rest of its terrible body. I didn't understand what I was seeing, even though the pale creature stood out in the darkness. I wanted to believe I was still in my tent dreaming this entire thing. The monster was a thing of nightmares. It was skinny, so much so I could see every bone in its body. It had arms so long they walked on its elbows. The rest of its arms folding backwards, sticking up above its head. The same was for its legs. It crawled on its knees. Legs pointed up towards the sky. The pale thing saw me. Inhuman sunken eyes on a flat human shaped face. Standing up I thought I could run. It was still a few feet away, and judging from how deformed its body was, I doubt it could move very fast. I only got to take a single step back when it raised an arm. The rest of its arm snapped the head, easily covering the distance of the clearing. I assumed it couldn't reach more with its entire arm because it was bent back, but I was mistaken. Twisted fingers grabbed the front of my shirt. I was dragged. 
too in shock to do anything. Raising me up, I met those horrible black eyes. The smell of rotting breath nearly made me pass out. I was so small and frail I could do nothing to fight against this monster. Most likely my father was dead. It would skin me and eat me and I couldn't do a damn thing about it. The whole situation was so bleak. I surprised myself over what I did next. I started to laugh again. The monster's features twisted in confusion. I still laughed until tears came back to my eyes. And that thing, whatever it was, copied me. It laughed my own voice back towards me and we both ended up laughing until I physically couldn't any longer. I wish I had an explanation of how I escaped from that creature. I was told later that I had been found on a hiking trail. A week later nearly starved to death. Even after my body recovered, my mind didn't. Everyone assumed I had killed my father in those woods and the event just broke me. I wish I could believe that and that the creature I had seen wasn't real. I don't remember the two years after I had been found. I ate and slept not doing much else. One day, I weakly laughed at a joke I overheard. When the doctors found out I would react to any kind of comedy, they were able to get me to laugh myself back to a new normal. I remember seeing that monster in the woods. Then, I was with my mother and a new little sister. No memories in between. I haven't yet told her about that creature. They found some rope with my father's blood on it. However, they didn't know where his body was. Or even how I got up into the tree to tie up that rope to start with. The case was still open and would be for the rest of my life. I do still want to give a warning to everybody about that thing in the woods. I'm sure it's still out there waiting. I don't know why it let me go. Maybe it was thankful I had given it the perfect voice to draw in others towards it. So if you ever go into the woods and you hear a child laughing, don't go towards it. That's actually the time to leave before it's too late. If you have read or listened to Anansi's Goatman story, you'll find that it's pretty similar to mine. I couldn't believe some stuff when I read it and how it compares to my experience that I'm about to tell you about. It was 2007. I was with a couple of my friends camping. I was 16 and was just with some 16 to 18 year olds on this fun camping trip out in the woods behind some of these guys houses. We picked a spot in the clearing where it would be like a little party kind of sight. Even though I'm not into drugs or even smoke weed or any of that. I grew up with that going all around me so I tried my best to avoid it. But nobody brought weed or anything along. I don't think so at least. So we all hung out in this clearing with three different tents set up and with a fire pit in the middle. We had planned to spend four to five days. It was summer vacation, so we didn't have school. I think this was early August, but anyways. So we all decide to hang out in the clearing, roasting marshmallows and everyone but me having beers. I sat around making s'mores and the sun was just beginning to set and we were all having a good time. At around 7 p.m. or so, we heard something moving in the bushes nearby and someone threw an empty beer bottle at the bushes. We heard the bottle break and we saw something climb out of the bushes and lumber back into the trees. We thought it was just some psycho person but everyone got a little bit nervous. Later that night I was asleep in the tent with three other people. The only person I knew was my friend Paul who is actually the one that invited me along. I remember everything being quiet and then I heard a sort of popping sound by the fire and we all sat up, crawling out 
we could hear people in the other tent's voices saying, the fuck was that? That's when Paul unzipped the tent and we crawled out. The fire which we had actually put out about an hour or two ago was now extremely high with flames. We put it out and thought maybe someone poured gas all over the fire and possibly lit a match or lighter and lit the fire. But we never heard the gas pouring or a match being struck or a lighter being flicked. We also didn't hear anybody running away because obviously we would have heard them. It was at this point that there was an awful smell except that I had a stuffy nose and couldn't make it out really. It may have been a skunk but Paul said one of the other guys said it smelled like rotten meat but we had not smelled it earlier or since then. Some other people began holding their shirts up to their noses as if a smell had just appeared. We were all on edge but I guess most of the people agreed and said fuck it let's just stay here. Nobody brought any guns to fend ourselves off but one guy who was about 18 said that he actually brought a pocket knife. On our second day there nothing happened until it became night again. At around 4 a.m. we were all fast asleep and were awoken by noises behind our tent. We started to get out when Paul said, shut the fuck up for a minute. We sat in silence listening to the noises which sounded like voices I couldn't make out. The voices seemed to be coming closer to us and we quietly climbed out of the tent. The voices still approaching our camp. The two other guys in our tent actually crept to the other tents and woke the other people up, telling them to get out of here at once. All 13 of us stood quiet, listening to the voices get closer. This was to the point where they were behind our tent. We heard the voices stop, but then an eerie humming noise was coming from the trees all around us. One of the guys, I think his name was Ben, who was 17 or 18, walked about 10 feet from the tree line where the voices had been coming from and he said, hey, who's there? And we quietly waited for a response. We heard nothing except distant crickets. He then walked back to us and right then we heard the voices moving away, which to me sounded like what Ben had asked. Hey, who's there? But it didn't sound like Ben moving away, almost like something was trying to mimic what he sounded like. I could hear the voice sort of crackly and jumpy, repeating those words as it moved off into the distance. Hey, who's there? Hey, who's there? We all got back to our tents but didn't sleep. The next day, someone had left to their house to grab something. They came back a little later with a potato gun saying he'll shoot the fuck out of the thing bothering our campsite. Around 7 p.m., we were just huddled around the fire, and a girl, just one of the two, stands up, practically pissing herself and we find out what's wrong. Before I continue, here's one of the similar things I found with the well-known Goatman story. She said that last night, when we were listening to the voices, there was another person with us. There was 13 of us now, but she insisted that there had been a 14. Reading the Goatman story and connecting that experience later made me scare. We all started to get nervous again, and Ben told us he was going to run back to the house. He and Potato Gun Guy were neighbors and he said he was going to get his father to come out here with a gun and wait. Someone actually went with him, and Paul and I were just talking to each other about how we could leave early if shit got too chaotic, which actually felt like it was starting to. We were in the middle of talking about how we should pack up when we saw Ben standing in the woods. It was him with his blue sweater and jeans, and he was looking directly at us from about 40 feet away, but we didn't know what the fuck he was doing. The person who went with him wasn't standing next to him. It was just him standing alone, watching us. It was a 25 minute walk back to his house, but he couldn't have been back in five minutes. That's when everyone got really uncomfortable and people started yelling, hey Ben, what are you doing? But he just kept watching us. 
We kept watching him as he seemed to slink back into the trees. By now, people were scared out of their minds and I was too. Why was Ben being a prick and just staring at us and not doing anything? That's when we decided to pile into one tent and just wait. Some short time later, the other Ben turned up with his dad. And the other person that went with him and his dad was holding a hunting rifle. Ben told him what happened with the voices. And the father walked that way into the trees and took a look around. He said it felt like eyes were watching him from every direction. Paul then told Ben's dad that we just saw another Ben standing in the woods staring at us. Ben's dad walked over there and looked around too. He came back and said that he could stay with us and the gun but said he would control it because if we got drunk and started shooting a gun around, we would all end up killing ourselves. He ended up sleeping in Ben's tent. It was our third night here, and it was really fucking creepy. We quietly listened for it, being anywhere nearby. I then looked at Paul, and he had a funny look in his eyes, and started sweating. He later told me that while we were all sitting around, he saw a strange figure moving through the forest, moving its arms around in a strange jumpy motion. Around 2 a.m., we were all getting ready for bed, and then we heard it. It was saying something but in a high voice. It sounded like it was saying, hey, who's there? Completely mimicking what Ben had said the night before. Ben's dad tried to pinpoint where the voice was coming from and fire a shot into the trees. The gunshot was loud as fuck. Right after, we could hear a creepy, chanting-like male voice. I was scared. Paul was scared. Shit, everyone was. The chanting sounded like a deep voice. Underneath the voice, we could hear something mumbling noises. Again, another shot was fired. But I saw what Ben's dad was shooting at. It was a figure crouched low by some bushes. It looked like a straight hit, but the figure did not move. Instead, it stood up, sorta of hunched over and moved back into the forest. That's when we raced back into our tents, and I could hear crying and screaming coming from right behind us. All four of us in the tent were getting scared, and then I could kind of smell a strong vinegar smell that was very strong. Then. I noticed what looked like fingertips moving along the tent wall and to the door and moved down the zipper to grab the part you used to open. Paul went over to the zipper and held it down as whoever or whatever tried to pull it open. Paul and one other guy in the tent started yelling, who's out there? Who the fuck is out there? And after a minute, we could hear a screeching noise as this thing took off into the darkness. That's when we finally said, Fuck the fourth and fifth day. Let's get the fuck out of here in the morning. But yet, here's the scariest experience of that night. At 3.45 a.m., I was checking my watch, and I had to go pee. Since what happened was just not too long ago, I decided I wasn't getting out of the tent, and maybe I could stick my bird out of a small zipper opening. But then I pictured that whatever was out there would end up biting or ripping my thing off. So I decided to open up the tent. I slid it outside just slightly and peed to the side of the door. As soon as I was done, I noticed someone standing at the furthest tent away. I grabbed my flashlight beside my pillow and turned it on and shined it towards the person. It looked like Paul with his back facing me, hunched over by the tent. But Paul was right behind me sleeping in the tent. I crawled back inside but kept my light shined on the other Paul. I whispered, Paul, wake up. And the moment he did, I looked outside to see the other Paul stand up and turn facing towards me and stare at me. I dove back in and leaped under my sleeping bag and huddled there awake as I explained to Paul what I had just seen. I guess at one point in the night, I ended up falling asleep and facing the opposite way. Because one of the guys in the same tent said that he woke up 
with his eyes still half closed as he rode over and that he could see the other paw looking through the tent flap that I didn't close. He thought it was just Paul coming to wake them up, but then he realized that the real Paul was asleep right beside him. That's when we packed up and left. So I guess that's the creepiest thing that happened to me. I don't know exactly where this forest was. It was on a private land. It's not like I'm going back, but damn, was that fucking scary. I have a couple different stories I can share. However, they're not that scary as this. I don't know why I'm here. I shouldn't have come. I knew I shouldn't have accepted the dare. Well, I couldn't back down from a double dare. Could I? My name is Jacob, but my friends call me Jake. My friends had dared me to come here at midnight to prove I wasn't a pussy. There was no way I could back down from a double dare, as everyone would know I was a coward. My friends and I were in the woods near our town, just messing around, you know teenage stuff. Our parents had always warned us to stay away from the woods as anything could happen in there. Of course, we didn't listen to them. We were 15 and we thought we knew better than them, as every teenager does. Our town's woods are like any towns. Parents warn us not to go in as a child, leading us to create fantastical tales about creatures living in the woods who only come out at night with the body of a deer and torso of a man with unicorns and dragons living in the deepest of the green utopia when the sky turns into an inky black of course we outgrew all of these childish creations and fantasies and we grew up to enjoy the woods. Often going in there to enjoy a sneaky smoke or to take their new girlfriend away from the prying eyes of their parents. We had entered the woods at just about 4 p.m. It was autumn and the clouds were hanging low over the treetops, looking pregnant and black, threatening to burst and shower us in heavy rain that had been expected for weeks now. My friends, Sam and Archie, were with me. Archie is my best friend. Ever since we met in second grade, we had gone on like a house on fire, and now we were practically inseparable. Sam was a big dude, towering over us at five foot eleven at just 15 years old. He was the guy you always wanted on your side when you got into a fight. Me and Sam didn't get on this very well. We had only met through a friend of a friend type thing and had never really bonded well. Sam was doing his usual bragging about the stuff he's got up to last night with his girlfriend that we all knew were just over exaggerated fantasies. We had just arrived at the clearing. That was its name. Everyone just called it the clearing. It was exactly that. A clearing in the center of the woods. With a large boulder in the center. That as kids, when we walked through the woods with our parents, we would climb to the top and yell funny phrases from our favorite cartoon at the time. We walked where the boulder was at, and our conversation tuned towards movies. We had all recently seen a horror movie together, and were just making comments at how we each saw the other flinch at certain scenes. Both Sam and Archie were claiming that I was the only one who jumped the most. And of course, 
Like any testosterone-driven teen, I was on the physical defensive immediately. Jokingly pushing Archie off the rock and kicking him lightly. They both talked about how I was always a pussy when watching horror movies. Always jumping at every shadow after the movie too. One thing led to the other and before I knew it, I had been there to prove that I wasn't the coward they were claiming I was. I had to stay in the woods with them until midnight and then they would leave me alone for an hour to see how long I would last in the dark woods on my own. I was hesitating to accept it there, thinking of my parents and stuff and it being a school night. But then Archie went and double dared me. You can't decline a double dare. I had to accept the challenge. We hung around waiting for midnight to come. They continued their conversations, but I couldn't get involved. I was far too nervous, dreading the moment I would be left alone in these dark woods. They had promised me they wouldn't be too far off and that they wouldn't be able to hear my girly screams, quote Sam, if I got too scared and wanted out of it. It wasn't the dark I was going to be scared of. It was what was unseen in the dark that worried me the most. My hands were shaking and I couldn't stop my breathing rate to increase as the minutes ticked down to midnight. Just 10 minutes to go, 10 minutes and then an hour standing in the pitch black woods in the clearing. Proving to my friends I wasn't a coward, was it worth it? I asked myself. I didn't know to live for the rest of my friendship with them being called a pussy or to stand through 60 minutes of sheer terror and dread. Damn it, I shouldn't have watched so many scary movies. My mind was a blur. My vision couldn't focus. I kept seeing things in the corner of my eye. Shadows behind trees that moved out of sight when I turned my full attention on them. Footsteps behind me. I knew it was all my imagination though. Just my imagination. Hey, Archie's voice cut through the mist in my mind. A deer. I squinted through the darkness in the direction he was pointing. Where? I heard Sam ask. Shh, you'll scare it away, Archie hissed. He gestured with his hand to the left side of the boulder, middle distance. And sure enough, there was a deer. It was standing still, absolutely stock still. It wasn't grazing the grass. It was looking around for possible dangers or predators. It was just standing there with its head pointed straight, looking east. Archie said, smiling at me. I nodded, my mouth still dry with nervous anticipation. I pulled out my phone to check the time to see how long I had left before I was left alone in these woods. But Archie stopped me, grabbing my hand and shaking his head. No, he whispered. The light from the phone might scare it away. I put the phone away and squinted through the darkness again at the still, motionless deer. We stood there for a few minutes, watching it. It hadn't moved once. Yo, why isn't it moving? Sam asked. Then the deer moved. I saw it. Just as Sam had said those words in his deep whisper. The deer turned its head to look at us. I felt a shiver go down my spine. I don't know why, but the way it had turned its head to look at us didn't seem right. The movement wasn't fluid, 
It wasn't like the deer was afraid of the noise and had whipped its head around to check it out. The deer had turned its head too slowly, too slowly for an animal of prey, hearing an unknown sound. It stared at us. We stared at it and nobody moved. The woods were silent. It was as if the trees and animals were all holding their breath in anticipation of what was about to occur next. It then moved again, so slowly, so unnaturally, and slowly, it started to walk. I don't know if walk is the right way to describe its movements actually. It was more forced, as if its legs didn't belong to it and it was trying to figure out how to use its limbs along the way. Jerky and slow movements, moving away into the darkness until the blackness surrounded it and we could no longer see it. None of us said anything for a long time. Sam turned to us. He ruined it. Of course he would. Enough of that weird ass deer. We're here for a reason, right? I could do nothing but stare at him. My heart beating so fast in my chest and my head swimming with thoughts. Archie didn't respond. Well, Sam demanded. Archie looked at me. I couldn't move. Fear had paralyzed me. I was scared of what I had just witnessed and the strangeness of it and the fear of the dare. Archie then shrugged at me. A dare is a dare, bro, was all he said to me. Taking out his phone, he checked the time. 12.03, a little over midnight. Well, Archie began, but Sam cut in. Come on, let's get to it. It's bloody freezing out here. He pulled down his beanie further on his head and sipped up his coat higher. Do the dare and let's get home where it's warm, all right? I nodded. I couldn't believe myself. I actually nodded. Despite all my internal senses going haywire, all of my gut telling me that this was the complete and wrong thing to be doing. I had nodded, sealing the dare and confirming my participation. The dare was on. They promised me they wouldn't be too far away, that they would be near the creek at the west entrance of the woods, about 100 meters away from the clearing I was in. Then they left me, left me all alone, alone in the dark, alone in the unknown, alone with who knows what. I silently cursed myself. I tried to control my breathing. My heart was hammering in my chest. I let out a sigh, watching as my breath vapor steamed the cold air in front of my face. I just had to make an hour, one hour, one hour. I walked to the boulder and leaned against it and waited and waited. And that's where I am right now, still waiting. I actually shouldn't be here. I know I shouldn't. I let out a sigh, taking out my phone, squinting at the sudden bright light of the display. I checked the time. 12.42, just 18 minutes. Time was going slowly. A loud noise interrupted me from my self-pitying thoughts. The sound of a twig snapping. Someone was moving near me. My eyes were wide, darting around trying to pierce the inky blackness of where my natural night vision couldn't see. I tried to swallow, but my mouth was too dry. The noise came again, this time from behind me. I spun around, trying to desperately squint through the darkness. I turned on my phone, turned on the flashlight, and shined it through the trees. It was Archie and Sam. I knew it. 
they were trying to prank me, try and make me scream. So then they could tell all of their friends that Jake was scared of the dark and was such a coward. My fist clenched tighter around my phone. Archie Sam, I know it's you, I called out. And the noise came again from my left. I whipped around and saw it. There was a deer standing there looking at me. It was close, like two meters away from me. I could see its coarse fur and its twisting antlers and its eyes. Its eyes were wrong. Its eyes were a deep, dark red. I stepped backwards. Those eyes, they had me transfixed. I couldn't stop staring into them. Then the deer started to move, jerky movements towards me. I was frozen in shock. I thought I heard a faint noise in the distance, some high pitched noise, but it was for a split second and I was left wondering if I had imagined it. The deer kept moving towards me, menacing, terrifying. I was paralyzed in fear. My body wanted to move, but I couldn't. All I could do was stand there as the deer kept stalking towards me so slowly. It wasn't a deer though. It was obvious, the eyes, the way it moved, the way it held its posture. It was clear that this was something else. What it was, I didn't know. It wasn't a deer for sure. Something was inside of it, wearing it, testing it out, and seeing how it worked. My body then came to life. I had control of my limbs, breaking free of its stare. I turned and fled. I wasn't paying attention to where I was running to, just anywhere from that. That thing, I looked behind me, it wasn't following me. It was standing in the clearing, watching me. I turned back to look where I was going, too late. I tripped over a log, I think. My knees with pain, pain seared through my left elbow. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the pain, and looked behind me. The woods were silent. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my own heartbeat and my heavy breathing. I heard footsteps, pounding footsteps coming towards me. Sam burst through the foliage, panting. It, it, he couldn't speak. His chest was heaving as he struggled to catch his breath. His hair and face was slick with sweat and he had lost his beanie on the run. It got Archie. It freaking got Archie, he managed to say. He noticed my look of confusion. The deer, the freaking deer, there was one there. We were watching it. I turned for a second and, and when I turned back, Sam broke into a hacking sob. He broke down. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. I realized this was the first time I had seen the big guy cry. When I turned back, there were bones on the floor. The deer had gone in, and there was this thing, this freaking ugly ass creature. It, it was horrible, dude. Sam broke down again. I could do nothing but stay crouched where I was, shocked out of my wits. It transformed in front of me, dude. It had taken his skin, like in the horror movies. Skinwalkers. They take the skins of their victims. More of them freaking deer showed up then, like about five of them, dude. Five of them. Next to the thing wearing Sam's skin, and then I, Sam coughed and spat onto the ground. I ran, ran like hell dude, oh my god, this freaking there, we should have never stayed. His tears stopped coming, and he collapsed onto the log. I was breathing heavily still. I saw a deer too, I managed to whisper. It was in the clearing. I ran, cause it just didn't seem right. If I had stayed. I grounded to a halt. There was a deer walking towards us. Its eyes were red. Run! I yelled, leaping to my feet and grabbing Sam by the arm, dragging him with me. I could hear the deer following us. Then, a loud crunch, and I knew that if I looked back now, it wouldn't be a deer following us. 
it would be one of those creatures Sam had described. I didn't look back though, just kept running, running and running. Then we got lost. Branches whipped in our face, foliage shredded our trousers. If one of us tripped, the other would simply keep going, dragging the other along with them until they got their pace back. We got split up, I don't even know how. I think there was a tree and Sam was going around the left of it, but I was going to the right. I let go of his arm for a second, I think. When I looked to where he had been, he wasn't there. I had lost him. I kept running until I couldn't run any further. I staggered to a halt and leaned against the tree trunk, trying to catch my breath back. I took a step forward and heard a little brittle crunch from underneath my shoe. I stepped back and looked down at what I had stepped on. There was something white on the floor. I took my phone out and shined its flashlight on the floor. Bones. There were bones on the floor, shattered by me stepping on them. I shined the light around more. There was a skull near the bushes. I wanted to vomit. This must be all that was left of poor Archie. I sank to my knees and I started to sob. And I started to cry, uncontrollably, racking, sobs. I fell onto my backside, but felt something underneath me. I sat up and picked it up. It was Sam's beanie. Then it clicked. I span around, and of course, there was Sam. But it wasn't Sam, of course. His pupils were red, and that smile wasn't right. The thing wearing Sam's skin forced Sam's grin even wider, and it said in a deep snarl, I dare you to run. Go on. Double dare. When I was younger, my mom would take us on a road trip to her hometown on the Navajo reservation. I would always ask her to tell me a skinwalker story along the way. I remember every story she's told me was when we were driving through miles of nothing at night. Lucky for us, nothing ever happened to us during those drives. Anyways, this is one of those stories that came from my aunt. So my auntie and some of her friends used to party a lot back in the day. They would hop in an old van, drive out to the boondocks, and just drink and have fun. Of course this all took place on the Navajo reservation after sunset, but on this specific night, that's what they were doing. Everything was going good and whatnot, when all of a sudden, they hear what sounds like rocks being thrown at their van. Everyone gets quiet as they wonder what the hell is going on. The sounds of rocks being thrown stops, and then, something jumps on top of the van roof. I should mention, my family owned the white van that we would use for road trips, cause it had enough room for my brothers and me. So imagine young me being told a story in a van. Terrifying, I know. So everyone starts panicking, and they all hurry to lock all the doors. My auntie jumps in the driver's seat and tries to start the engine. At this moment, of course, the old van then refuses to start, and whatever is on the roof is still up there making banging noises at this point. It sounds like it's jumping up and down. My auntie is freaking out when she sees a hand with long nails reach over the roof and start scratching the windshield. At this point in the story, my mom would take one hand off the steering wheel and scratch the windshield to simulate it. Then whatever was on the roof jumps off. Everyone is still scared, yelling at my auntie to start the van, and she keeps trying. That's when she sees the skinwalker walk up to the driver's side window and stare at her, just a few inches away. Well, that's when my auntie jumped in the back and started praying for her life. Minutes pass and the skinwalker appears to leave. Then my auntie hops back in the driver's seat 
and gets the van to start and off they go. I'm not sure if skinwalkers are real, but I have heard stories. A couple of minutes ago, I was closing up my chicken coop so that no critters can get in after dark. And for some reason, every single night, when I go on lock up on the other side of our electrical fence, I hear something pacing back and forth. Sometimes the pacing gets closer, or it sounds like it's going from left to right but never comes close enough. I use my phone's flashlight so it's not too bright, but maybe it sees the phone light and walks where I'm at. Sometimes if I'm out there for a couple of minutes, I hear moaning and weird sounds, sounds that I don't even recognize from any other animal. I live in a small part of my town in Ohio, so there's not that many people. I also don't know that much about skinwalkers, but I'm all alone right now and it's a little scary. I'm 14 years old and I'm house sitting my grandparents while they're on vacation. So back to this thing by the chicken coop. Whenever it walks by, it sounds like it has two legs. So sometimes I think it's a person, but I can never build up the courage to call it out. Also, when it walks by, it makes a lot of noise. I can hear it from 20 to 30 feet away. I don't know why, but the walking around and weird noises freak me out. And just to give you a different picture, the noises weren't human-like or even animal-like. I'm sitting on my bed right now typing this and I'm kind of freaking out. So if anyone's out there, tell me that I'm just a teenage boy who's imagining things and there's no need to worry tell me the tricks to stay out of the way of skinwalkers because I'm starting to get scared thank you for reading this and yes this is very real one summer when I was only 14 years old I spent a couple of weeks at my grandparents' house on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. It was close to the New Mexico state line, even though it was out in the middle of the hills. It was an awesome place. My little brother, he was 11. My grandmother was a great cook. She makes the best fried bread. And my grandfather tells great stories. The kind that you can't hear anywhere else. Now, thanks to that visit there, I have a story of my own. My grandparents have this old guy, a Navajo too, who does odd jobs around the house. His name is Paul. He carries around the silver flask. One evening, as soon as the sun is going down, my grandmother then tells me to take him home. My grandfather is the one who always does it, but he is out at a neighbor's ranch helping with some cattle. I say sure and it gives me the chance to drive my grandfather's old pickup truck, something that I have never been allowed to do back home. But there on the reservation, no one cares. There's a few people around. It's not like you're gonna hurt anyone. So my little brother jumps in with me while Paul and my grandparents' dog climb into the bed. Paul lives in a small Hogan, about 10 minutes deeper into the res. By the time we drop him off, the sun is already going down. Back on the road, there's no street lights of any kind. We are driving along when out of the corner of my eye. I notice some movement there in the scrub and low bushes off to the side. I slow down. There are all kinds of sheep around there. The people who own them, letting them roam about the place freely. I don't want to explain to my grandma why there is blood from a sheep in the front grill. As we drive past the spot where I saw the movement, there's nothing there. So I resume speed, bumping along the dirt road without a care in the world. Then out of nowhere, we get a strong whiff of something nasty, as if some animal has died and its body is rotting 
where it fell. With it comes this sense of deep dread for which I have no explanation. My little brother feels it too, and he doesn't say as much, but I can see it in his face. I then tell him that everything is good, and we keep on driving. Moments later, I look in the rear view mirror and see this dark silhouette of something very tall and very skinny, covered with some kind of hair or fur, running behind the truck after us. Whatever it is, it doesn't look human. My brother sees it too, and he starts crying. My grandparents' dog is in the back, barking. I'm wanting to make the truck go faster, but the dirt road is so uneven, and the pickup is bouncing and shaking all over the place as it is. I'm afraid if I go any faster, I'll crash it off to the road. My brother then starts to scream because it's coming up alongside the truck on my side. I remember being so scared that all I'm thinking is that this thing is going to get us. Then just as I'm ready to cry too, around the bend and coming at us is this car. Just like that, the feeling of dread and panic disappears. Whatever was chasing us is now gone. When we get back to my grandparents place, we run into the house, checking at our backs to make sure we weren't followed. My grandmother, obviously seeing that we are upset, tells us what's the matter. We can't get the story out fast enough. She tells us it was Yinadoshi, something the Navajo call a skinwalker. She explains that they are people who use black magic and bad medicine. I've been back there many times since then, but this is my only encounter with a skinwalker. So this happened about 12 years ago. My family owns a farm in the heart of an Indian reservation. One winter I was home for Christmas, taking care of the farm. As I was home by myself, late in the night, I hear all of our cows freaking out. I knew it had to be the wild dogs. There are plenty of those in the area. So I throw on some boots, grab a shotgun, load it up, and head out to the field. This was a perfect scenario for a horror movie. It was cloudy, but there was a full moon, and it was breaking through the clouds just right to light up all the snow. I ran out into the middle of the field, and just in time I see two dogs, but they were standing up, facing each other, and fighting. I think, perfect, two for one. So I pump a shell into the chamber of Mr. 12 Gauge, and then it happened. The two dogs heard the rack, they both stopped, looked over at me, and ran away on their back legs. I froze, and every ghost story about skinwalkers and all the other native legends I grew up with came to my mind. Also, keep in mind that I am a white guy, and up until then, these were all just boogeyman stories that the native kids like to tell to scare us. But that night, they became real to me. My uncle is Mexican and Native American. This happened in the Mojave Desert in South California. He was driving around with his girlfriend late at night and they saw something that looked like a huge black dog on the side of the road. He slowed down and the dog then began crossing the road. Instead of walking like a normal dog would, this thing moved like a toy rocking horse. He said it stopped in the middle of the road and stared at them and its eyes had a red glow. My uncle is the most badass person I know, and it scared the shit out of him. A man from the reservation has just delivered a bull to a buyer's ranch out to the far reaches of the reservation. Getting lost in a couple of hours, it is a large expanse of land and what maps are available, aren't always available. Anyways, it's late and getting dark by the time he gets home on the main road towards home. Just as he gets to the intersection where there's no stop sign, he sees up ahead, right in the middle of the road, 
alone, coyote. It's just standing there. So before he starts driving, he leans on the horn. In response, he watches as the coyote raises up on its back legs. It assumes the form of a man, only his legs and feet. Arms and hands seem more canine than human. And with a spastic gait, it starts walking towards the opposite shoulder. The man, not believing what he's seeing, closes his eyes and shakes his head. When again he looks, there's the coyote sitting off to the side of the road and looking back at him as if it's waiting on him to drive by. The man, certain that it's the lights playing tricks on him and the fact that it has been a long and draining drive. However, as he passes the coyote, he gives it a quick look and he sees that this coyote is grinning back at him. Having heard stories of skinwalkers, the man blesses himself and he fixes his eyes on a road ahead. Me and four of my buddies on a reserve. Day one about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a fat black bear. We only had what you call muzzle loaders. They are like a Civil War style gun. You get one shot, then you gotta reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer, so at 2 p.m. after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We end up finding a hellacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him pick me up, I'll be on the road after dark. He's about seven miles away. I sit there from 2 p.m. till dark and all I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway. So it does get dark and I creep down to the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see something crashes into thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I'm thinking that maybe it's a deer. So I call just to get a reaction, but nothing. So I creep on it thinking I can bust it if it's a deer, but it doesn't move. He's just sniffing like a dog. Sniff, sniff, sniff. I kick the ground and stop trying to bump it, but the dog just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear and I'm 10 feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm gonna have to hip shoot it if it's a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot, a big elk off to my right in the full moonlight. I see something drive out of the bushes into the thickest part in the road to my left. It's a standoff, eyes reflecting back. They look eight inches apart four foot off the ground. It's just sniffing over and over. It's full, dark, and this thing is stalking me using cover. My buddy lights start shining down the road and this thing crashes through the bushes away. I figure it's a bear, but I don't know. I was a little bit scared, I'm not gonna lie. I had one shot in the dark. Coyotes howling like crazy too. And the predators, we're out in full effect on the full moonlight.